Everyone, thank you so much for joining me for another iWoman Report. I'm Kathleen Trigg-Jones in our iWoman broadcast studio in New York City. As you know, September is Hispanic Heritage Month. We have a great interview with the woman who's been named the number one Latina female entrepreneur by Women in Business Magazine, my good friend, Victoria Jen. Also on this episode, we're talking about consent. You hear that word thrown around a lot these days, especially in the era of the Me Too and Time's Up movements, but do you really know what it means, specifically in the context of criminal justice? Well, we're going to be joined later by the author of a book breaking down the keys to conquering sexual assault, as well as one of the women who spoke up against Bill Cosby that resulted in a huge court battle. But first, this week's top story. Our hearts go out to our Hispanic sisters and brothers in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Fiona ripped through the island, causing massive flooding and catastrophic damage. Thousands are still without power. I have a home myself in Puerto Rico where my family and I spend a lot of our time. Thankfully, our house is okay. However, our area remains without power and reliant on generators, but other parts of the island that were hit much, much harder are still really suffering. I am working with several of my neighbors to get the word out about an effort that they have already begun organizing. I have to say my community is amazing, and this is when people really come together. They have swung into action over the past few days, pooling their money together and hitting the streets, literally going to the store to Costco, taking their money, getting supplies, delivering food, water, and anything else that's needed to help those hit hardest. We're going to be collecting some funds to send to them to help purchase more items to deliver around the island. In just a minute, I'll let you know how you can also help in this effort. Right now, I want to bring in one of my neighbors who's actually spearheading that effort on the ground in Puerto Rico in the Bahia Beach area. Marcella Canyon is the CEO and um, executive director of a not-for-profit organization in Puerto Rico called Alma de Bahia, and you've been on the ground going around Puerto Rico, delivering supplies all day long. Thank you, first of all, for the work that you're doing, and thanks for coming on the iWoman Report. Can you just give us an idea of what you're seeing, Marcella, in Puerto Rico? Yes, hi, Kathleen. Thank you so much uh, for supporting these efforts. Uh, we are seeing uh, really high situations. Uh, this is going longer and longer. There's lots of areas that are flooded. And uh, there are not basic services like, you know, uh, water, potable water or electricity. So it changes from one place to the other. What do people really need in the outskirts, the places where you've been going? Well, uh, the main need is water and food. Those things are basic. We also need cleaning supplies, uh, basic hygiene products. Uh, there's also need for clothing. And in some areas they're needing also construction um, elements uh, to rebuild roofs. And there was people that it still had tarps from Maria. So those right. were really, really badly hit. So to look for a way for sustainability, that's one of the main things that I think we should work with. So right now it's relief, right? A relief aid, emergency aid, but in the long run is to look for ways to be resilient, but resilient uh, in the sustainability um, right. approach. So there was one family who lost their entire roof and then everything in their house was just water damaged. Can you tell us about that? Yes, it's really sad and it's not the only one. We have several families that had uh, this situation throughout the island. It's how with the storm and the winds, they lose the roofs and then everything in their house is damaged. So in this case, they Sirino family. Pablo, he lost his wife uh, one year ago. She's a diabetic. It was a sad situation. And now he's losing his roof. He lives with his son. His parents also live there. And they really do need a lot of help. So yeah. uh, no roof. Uh, his stove got uh, like totally flooded and damaged. Uh, his All his furniture. He doesn't have a bed to sleep on. They don't have pillows and sheets and like there's like everything yeah. in the house is gone right uh, we don't even think of all of the things that you need until it until it's gone we also went to the boys and girls club there in puerto rico um and i i know that the schools are closed right now but the boys and girls club you said is actually um helping those families of the of the kids that they serve 
they are right now, they're not having the after school program that they usually have with 150 kids, but they are providing food for their families, the families of the kids. So they're cooking. We are donating water, potable water, because they don't have access to potable water right now. That's a main need here. Going to the families to bring like warm food. And uh, we hope to be able to, to get to those areas tomorrow. How would people watching this donate if they want to? Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have a PayPal account uh, that I'm going to send you the link so you can uh, share and also a QR code. You can also donate through credit card or do direct deposits in our account. Uh, I'll send you the number so we can share uh, with people that are interested. You can also send things through email, uh, checks, uh, to mail, I mean. Uh, checks and uh, even if you want to donate for the future. So right now, as I was mentioning, we are doing this emergency effort, but uh, during the next weeks, we are gonna help these families to rebuild their homes, to get their furniture together. So we don't like to just go and act during the emergency and then disappear. I think right. we're part of the community, we're there, we're neighbors. We wanna be part of it, we care. So oh, I love it. I we love want it. to monitor, uh, be there, help them to do things right. Good. Right. Uh, In the sense that we can all build together. So yeah. um, we are well, going to, to work on that. OK, Marcella, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, we really appreciate everything you're doing down there. Hopefully, I'll be able to get down the, back down there with my family to also help. But in the meantime, we're going to make it possible for people to contribute to the fund that you're collecting so that you can continue to go out and do the work that you're doing. Um, keep in touch with me and let me know how things are going. But thank you again so much for coming thank on the so iWoman much. Report. We will be sending all the funds collected directly to the organization Alma de Bahia to help with their efforts. Please log on to trighouse.org or you can text help PR to 51555. Again, 100% of the funds that we collect will go to help the victims of Hurricane Fiona. You may know that Fiona hit nearly five years to the day after Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico. I'm proud to announce uh, after that call last night, we immediately deployed uh, or started to activate police officers. We'll have over 100 troopers from the New York State Police Department on their way to Puerto Rico uh, over this next week. And as the need continues to arise, we'll be ready to offer other resources and support. We'll be there long for the long-term recovery. We know from the Marie experience, this is not fixed in a day or week or a month. It takes a sustained, concerted approach, and we have experience. I helped organize a similar effort back then following Hurricane Maria, which left nearly 3,000 people dead. There are eerie similarities between Fiona and Hurricane Maria. I'd like to invite all of you to watch a documentary that I produced about Hurricane Maria and just how badly the people there suffered for so long. It was the storm that changed everything. On September 20th, 2017, powerful Category 4 Hurricane Maria made history as the strongest storm to hit the tranquil island of Puerto Rico in 89 years. A botched recovery by an indifferent administration, long on excuses. It's very tough because it's an island. In Texas, we can ship the trucks right out there and, you know, we can do, we've, we've gotten A pluses on Texas and on Florida. And short on solutions. We pulled together our friends, family, and staff and headed to Puerto Rico, taking what we could with us and FedEx pitching in to ship the rest. La tormenta es horrible, pero con ayuda con la, el mundo, podemos reconstruir esta isla. It's very important that each person helps another person. You can watch the full documentary on iWoman.tv. Okay, switching gears. As I said earlier, we're going to be discussing consent and sexual assault awareness. There's a movement by some to clearly define what consent means. Joining us to talk about why it, we need to have a clearly defined definition added to the law 
and why it's so critically important are two survivors of sexual assault. Joyce Short is the author of Your Consent, The Key to Conquering Sexual Assault, as well as the chief executive of the Consent Awareness Network, and she's joined by Andrea Constan, founder of Hope, Healing, and Transformation, who also is one of the victims to speak out against Bill Cosby. Let's just start, if we could, with, um, with the definition of consent. I mean, it's a word that we hear so often that we toss it around and think we know, but do we really know what consent means? Well, unfortunately, uh, not only do we not know, but our laws don't know what consent is. Uh, but it's backed up by a lot of uh, codes, so we're not just talking out of the, uh, out of the seat of our pants. Uh, consent is actually freely given knowledgeable and informed agreement by a person with the capacity to reason. Nuremberg Code tells us so, Model Penal Code, General Data Protection Regulation, uh, even canon law going back for centuries has told us so. Uh, but for some reason, it's escaped the grasp of our legislators, and therefore it hasn't been put into law, it hasn't been codified. So it's not, it should be, a, it's a human right, uh, but we need to make it a civil right. Why does this matter so much? Why does the definition, um, the term giving it more power, why does that make a difference? Well, it makes a difference in the lives of survivors. There were two trials in my case against Bill Cosby and um, the jurors in the second trial, uh, one of, while they were deliberating, they, they went back to the drawing room and they asked the judge what the definition of consent was. And the judge said to them to go to, to basically use their common sense. And I was just astounded um, that there was no definition um, in, in my case. And so for me, a lot of the work that I'm doing with Joyce is about defining consent. And, and I, you know, and so for me, I, I do believe that it would have had a, a, a different out, even though the outcome was successful in my case, I do believe that it might have even changed the first trial. The flip side of this is that um, if you are the, the person, the perpetrator, then you also wanna know that common sense is gonna be used in your case, I would imagine. You wanna make sure that you also have the same right to be able to prove your innocence. Does this impact the perpetrator's right? It impacts them in actually a very positive way because it makes prosecution much more simple. Uh, it's a question of whether the person used malicious influence or whether they didn't use malicious influence. In, in your case with, with um, Bill Cosby, the fact that the perpetrator is in a place of a position of power, does that then add to um, that, that you know, definition that we're talking about right now, that that in, that in fact could have an impact on a case? I don't think there would have been much deliberation in my case, to be honest with you, because you have to look at incapacitation and how defining consent in this situation involves incapacitation. Defining consent, it, it, it doesn't necessarily, it affects maybe the prosecutors and the defense attorneys, but also it helps the juries come to a, a decision. And the jurors didn't have that a definition to work with. And so I think when jurors are deliberating, it would actually help them. It would actually be a, a positive for them. But once they had a definition to work with that wasn't given to them by the legal system, they were actually able to come to a conclusion. And so it goes to show that having a definition for consent um, in our penal code, in the legal system, will change the outcomes and hold predators accountable going forward. Well, listen, um, I want to thank both of you for joining us today and, and also for fighting, continuing to fight on behalf of, of women and survivors, um, male and female, um, in, our, in our country. Where can we find more information or get involved? Uh, we uh, have a petition that people can sign in order to support the bill that we have pending in New York. We also have a um, passed uh, recently uh, a, uh, an amendment to uh, the national defense, uh, uh, the, the, it'll affect UCMJ, which is okay. military law. So you can actually go online to our, it's um, a change.org petition that says um, our justice system is broken uh, and sign our petition. That would be tremendous. 
Uh, you can get a copy of Your Consent, The Key to Conquering Sexual Assault on Amazon. And you can also log into uh, the Consent Awareness Network uh, on, um, you know, uh, on our webpage. Okay, very nice. Um, Joyce Short and Andrea Constant, thank you so much for joining us. You can listen to the complete interview on iWoman.tv. To learn more, visit consentawareness.net. And be sure to check out Joyce Short's book, Your Consent, The Key to Conquering Sexual Assault. You can also read Andrea's memoir, The Moment, which discusses her journey to getting justice. Speaking of strong, powerful women, in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, I sat down with the woman named the number one female Latina entrepreneur by women in business, my dear friend Victoria Jen, founder of the Female Collaborative and Dare to Leap Academy. I'm always excited when I can invite a friend to come into the iWoman studio with me. Um, Victoria, Jen, we have been going back and forth for a few years as, as fellow entrepreneurs. Um, welcome to the iWoman Report. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm, I'm even more excited. First, happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you. Yes. Shout out to all my Latinos. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 wear, you wear it, and you've done so much to help women. I first met you when you launched the Female Collaborative. Correct. And you were doing these amazing um, workshops and, and uh, events with women, bringing women together, creating this culture. But you didn't stop there, because now you have a new venture that you've launched. I do. So my latest baby is the Dare to Leap Academy, where I teach women how to do essentially what I did, right? So I was in corporate for 15 years, and then I transitioned into entrepreneurship. Been in the game for five years, and now I teach women how to do exactly the same thing I did, right? How to make that transition, but I really focus on them building the business while they're still working, so they still have their financial security, and really honing in on the three major things that have served as major lessons learned for me as I've been building my business which is mindset, right? Mindset is critical and key to everything that we do, the foundation of everything that we do, and the business fundamentals, right? So a lot of entrepreneurs, they'll skip over, you know, formalizing their business in the right way, understanding business taxes, business credit, and they get dinged in the long run, especially small business owners, right? And you don't know what you don't know. And so exactly. uh, you can learn from my mistakes <laughs> inside the academy. And then, of course, once we teach you how to build a business, a solid business with a plan, we then tell you how to go and sell, right? And how to pitch your business so you can actually drive revenue. So one of the major keys is surrounding yourself with women like you, right? Who have been in the game longer than you, who have lessons learned to share, wisdom, and who are willing to teach you. And, and I do agree with you, like surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you. And yes. I always say that, and you know, it's a little cliche, but if you're the smartest person in the room, you really need to choose a new room because you're, you stop learning at that point and you're only, and now your cup is just constantly being emptied and right. it's not being filled. And that can be intimidating for people, right? Mm -hmm. To step into a new space, to be in a room where maybe you're the only woman, you're the only person of color and people are using vernacular that you've never heard before and people are in different tax, bracket, tax brackets and so you feel a way about it because you're like, ooh, and you start feeling like an imposter, which is why I yes. do a lot of work around imposter syndrome which essentially, to put it in layman's terms, is you just feeling like you don't belong, regardless of the sweat equity you put in, regardless of the work, regardless of you actually belonging to be in that room, you just feel like you don't belong because you're uncomfortable, because you're the only one, or you're the first one, or you're being stretched in a way that you've never been stretched before, and, and that makes you uncomfortable. Let's talk about personal life. So when you're an entrepreneur, and especially as a woman, don't you think that women have so, so many different things to deal with as a, as a business person? You, you know, you're, you, you, we just think differently. You know, we, if, if you're single, if you're married or whatever, we as a, when we show up in a room, we're just very different. How does, how do you think, um, you know, women have it harder or easier than men in business? Yeah, I mean, we do have a competitive advantage in the sense that we do have a level of empathy. We do have a level of love and camaraderie and collaboration about us that men do not have. And I think over the last three years, we've all began to understand the significance of humanizing the work that you do and, and how you can build true, genuine relationships. And people will pour into you the more vulnerable you are. And I think that comes easier to women than it does to men. So that is a competitive advantage. But I've also seen how that could serve as an Achilles heel, right? And against you yeah. because business is hard. 
and there's savages out here, okay? And you gotta have the thick skin. And so you have to know when to turn it on and when to turn it off and when to focus on the mission and not your feelings. How do you balance the two? Ooh, I'm still learning to do that every single day. But, you know, I started my career on Wall Street. I grew up in New York. So I like to think that I have this thicker skin uh, because of that. And I learned a lot from being in that space. Uh, but as I get older, I become more and more empathetic and really tapping into my femininity, which serves as also a competitive advantage, right? And I think it takes a lot of trial and error. It takes experience. It takes, uh, you know, realizing your mistakes and learning from those mistakes and then approaching things differently and, and testing it out and giving yourself grace that you don't know everything and you're going to make mistakes and not really um, holding yourself back when you make those mistakes, you know, kind of take it on the chin, like Aaliyah says, brush yourself off and try again and just continue the learning. I just wanted to really um, ask you, this is Hispanic Heritage Month. Yes. So what does that mean to you as an as a entrepreneur who is Latina, who is a woman, um, and who's really you know, made, made great strides in this business and yeah. in life? You know, I appreciate the celebration around it. I appreciate, you know, the awareness that it builds. But I have to be honest, I wish this was happening 12 months out of the year and 365. But a lot of the work that I do is to remind organizations that just don't support us during this month. We are, we have incredible buying power. And so can people find you at your website? What is the website? How do they sure, sign up? Sure, people can find me at victoriajen, J-E-N-N dot -N com. You can find everything and anything about me, the Dare to Leap Academy my bio, how, how to work with me. You can also catch me on the gram and across social media at I M I A M Victoria Jen, J-E-N-N. -N. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the iWoman Report Thank and, you for uh, having and dropping me. all these nuggets. We really appreciate you. Thank Come you. back anytime. My pleasure. All right. It was so great to talk with Victoria about all of her successes in business. You can find out more by visiting her website at DTL Academy. Dot biz. Make sure you show your support. Hispanic Heritage Month goes until October 15th, but let's remember, Hispanic Americans deserve to be recognized 100% of the year. And that brings me to my thought of the day. As we've seen by our guests today, women are powerhouses, whether it be making it in the male-dominated business world or overcoming trauma publicly to seek justice. Women are capable of anything we put our minds to, and it is heartwarming to see powerhouse women making strides toward real change in the world. I always say, if you want to see change, be the change. That's going to do it for this iWoman Report. Everyone, please stay healthy, stay happy, and stay safe. And again, if you would like to help contribute to the fund to help the residents of Puerto Rico, you can do so by visiting trighouse.org or text help PR to 51555. And we'll see you next time.